Hello, you beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of the Roaring Ages podcast. I have a special guest here, Liam Barningham. Did I say that right? Early- yes, sir. <laughs> um, Liam joined me last spring. It was early spring, right? Yep. And Liam was 18 years old and about to get his real estate license. So Liam reached out and said, hey, I got my license. Let's do a checkup. So how's it going? It's going good. Uh, you know, it has its ups and downs for sure. I think the main thing and one of the things we go over on my team is just don't get too excited. Don't get too upset because it's going to go both ways. So uh, it's going both ways and just got to deal with it and get it done. I love that. That is so true. Reduce the lows and reduce the highs because this, this, this game is ridiculous what it will do to your emotions. So let's, let's go back to the beginning. What was your original goal date to get your license? Uh, my original goal was to get it about a month after graduating because I wanted to graduate, schedule the exam, and then study. And uh, I graduated at the end of May. And then I forget exactly when I took my exam, but I officially became an agent on August 1st. Okay. So a few months later. Yep. Graduated on May 27th, scheduled the exam, studied, and uh, I passed it first try. Good job. And then got my license, joined a team, and started moving. All right. Don't get ahead of the story. Don't get ahead of the story. Let's let's, let's keep them guessing. So what was – why did it take you longer? So really what I want to talk about is because a lot of people get into real estate and they think I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So I want to talk about your expectation versus reality. Um, why, what held you up from getting your license as fast as you originally thought? Well, there's some things you just can't control. Um, you know, especially with COVID, there's been a lot of people becoming agents. Uh, the DBPR. 100,000 more agents at the end of 2021 than there were at the beginning. Wow. That's, and you have to imagine a lot of people left, 100,000 more agents. So 1.5 something million agents mm. out there. So just decide wow. everyone. You're right. You're absolutely right. A lot of people are getting their license. Sorry, go ahead. Insane. But yeah, you know, the DBPR can only do its job so fast. Uh, so you try to schedule the exam and, uh, you know, you have to pick a certain date sometimes that might be a couple months out. I wanted to do it in person. I didn't want to do it online. So that added additional delay. Um, That's just the way it is. So one thing, um, because I had to graduate high school because you have to have a diploma to get your license. um, I didn't know if I needed my diploma to schedule the exam or if I could schedule it before I graduated and then take it like a week after I get my diploma. Since I didn't know, I couldn't find anybody who did. So I just played it safe. And that was, that was some additional time for sure. And then of course, just the uh, backlog of other agents taking their exam as well. How hard was the test in your estimation? Well, uh, they don't tell you how many you got correct or how many you got wrong, but, um, really? yeah, they don't, they don't, you know, they just say past, you know, so I don't know if I barely squeaked by, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying a lot of hours and days studying for that exam. And so um, preparation is just the biggest, you know, component. You need to make sure that you're prepared, but it wasn't that bad going into it after studying a lot. Okay. All right. So you had a plan of, you said, I'm going to get my license and I'm going to do what after you, what did you think you were going to do after you got your license? Oh, I had no idea. Um, Really? Yeah. I I just knew I wanted to become an agent and start working. I had no idea what it was like though. So I was in high school and I was interviewing brokerages before I had my license because I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to interview them. And then a couple months later, right before I got my license, I would go and meet with them again. So that was my plan. I think I went to like seven or eight different uh, brokerages. But, you know, as far as planning went, that's all I had. 
Okay. My, I, just, I just had a plan to get my license and then, you know, kind of just wing it, for lack of a better term. With all those discussions with different brokerages, you, you must have gotten kind of different takes on how the business works. Just talking to them, what, what opened your eyes up? What <laughs> bad phrasing? How, what did they open your eyes up to as far as real estate that you didn't really get? What did you learn? Well, um, actually, the biggest thing I learned, because going into it, I wanted, you know, a team atmosphere. I wanted to come into the office and there's other agents in the office. We could bounce ideas, you know, do a mastermind, you know, to come up and work together. And, and so going to these interviews, I go into the offices and they were almost empty. So <laughs> the biggest gut check was, you know, it's just for a majority of you know, teams and brokerages, it's not much of a team atmosphere at all. Right. You know, you're kind of by yourself uh, if you go to a specific brokerage. And so that was the biggest thing that caught me off guard that I didn't, you know, think was the case beforehand. Was there any part where you talked to all these people, you're like, hold up, real estate's not what I thought it was? Or was there any part of you that kind of made you question your path? No, because like I said, I had no idea what real <laughs> estate was like, you know, uh, my parents invest. So I grew sure. up on the investment side, but as far as being an agent, I just knew you needed to prospect and get business. I, I didn't know about the intricacies of being an agent. And so, uh, going into it, I wasn't dissuaded because I, I went in thinking, I'm sure it's worse than I think it is, uh, yeah. because I think. I don't think anything, you know, I had no idea. So going into it, I was kind of just uh, riding the wave, seeing what happened. All right. And then you got your license. What did you do on day one? Uh, well, I joined a team because I was looking for that team atmosphere and I, I joined this team. I just knew, you know, that's the place I needed to be. So when day you one. Know? Uh, when I first, well, not when I first went in. So I, I interviewed with one of the agents on the team on um, a Monday. Excuse me. Got some congestion. It's that, that time of year. But I, I interviewed with one of the team leaders on Monday. And then they have a meeting every Tuesday. He invited me. He was like, do you want to come to this meeting? I was like, mm. sure. I went to the meeting and that's when I knew I could feel it. You know, I just got that feeling that this is where I need to go. And uh, to go back to your question, what did I do on day one? I was training, learning contracts, practicing, not quite getting business yet, but getting prepared, just like studying, uh, you know, getting that preparation so I was ready. And uh, that's how I spent the first couple of weeks to a month. During the summer, what did you do to prepare yourself for your career? Uh, I read books. Uh, I, I've grown to really like reading. I think that's the key because if you have an issue, someone's gone through it before and there's a book about it. So read books. Uh, there's plenty on being a real estate agent. So the main thing I did was read those books and uh, study for the exam. What were some of those books? Some of those books, um, Ninja Selling by Larry K Kindle. That's a great book. I really enjoyed it. And another top one for me was the millionaire real estate agent. That one was fantastic. And then actually on the prospecting side, fanatical prospecting by, uh, I want to say his name is Jeb Blunt Blount. That's a good book as well. Those are my top ones. Awesome. Um, so you did, you did some training for the first three weeks. When did you do your first when did you do your first prospecting of any sort? Um, and what was it? I think it was maybe the end of August. I want to say maybe mid to the end of August. Uh, we have a, a CRM, the uh, customer relations manager, and uh, we have leads in there. So they gave me access. I went into what we call the pond. And uh, 
I just started calling leads that have been on our website or, you know, Google. And uh, I started giving them calls. And that was my first taste of speaking with potential clients. What that feel like? Well, first, uh, of all, first of all, are you, do you, would you have considered yourself a cold caller before this? Do you see someone no. who's no problem calling people? Uh, well, I've never done it before, especially in this way, but I, I never had an issue with it. You know, okay. a lot of people talk about being afraid or scared to make those calls. Yeah, I, I wasn't like that because, uh, you know, if someone said no, they said no. If they cursed me out, hang up the phone. So I, w I wasn't too worried about it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's the phone. They're not in front of you. It, they can't do anything to hurt you. So again, I went in, I tried to go in with no expectations just to see what happens. And uh, it, it worked out pretty good. You, you find uh, the people actually aren't that deep. You know, you, you, might get, you might get some, but like, I think the worst I had was some guy tell me, you shouldn't do this and call people. Okay. And I hung up the phone and I called somebody. And I mean, out of, I must've called 1500, 2000 people by this point. I mean, I don't think I've, I've had no one cuss me out. I mean, I've had people be nasty, but they probably just had a bad day. They're just taking it out on me. And it wasn't even that bad. So, so everyone listening to this, who's afraid of calling, you've, you've probably heard my podcast with Mac Bell and he talks about calling. This is the attitude to have too many people take the nose as rejection. That is not rejection. That's just that person at that moment saying, it's just a no. Why do we, why do we raise that up to level rejection? So I'm, I'm glad to hear this from someone who's new, from someone who's young, taking that right attitude, just, take the call and move on. Good job. Yeah, you, exactly. So you said the pond, do you get some deals out of there? Do you get some, uh, some clients? I have. Yep. I I've closed some deals out of there. Um, how many, how long do you think it took you to get your first, first client, not closing, but first client out of the pond? How many days? Uh, going or? Yeah, I'd say, you know, two or three days because I was calling a lot of people. So it didn't take me that long. Um, at one point in the beginning, I was calling a hundred people a day on the weekends as well. So, you know, at some point you call that much, you're bound to get someone to pick up the phone and then you were can you, just. Were you calling or were these people you actually contacted a hundred? Oh, I was calling a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you, you did so Sorry to get into the details, but the details kind of matter. If you remember, how many people do you think you talked to before you got that first client? Uh, maybe 10 ish. You know, it actually it was a pretty good conversion rate. I think I got pretty lucky in the beginning. Um, I got some clients pretty easily. You know, um, that good. I mean, I don't remember it too vividly because it was, you know, three or four months ago, but it wasn't that difficult. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't easy. We say um, simple, but not easy. Yep. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, I was making those calls and yeah, I actually, I got a couple of clients pretty quickly, of course, uh, still haven't converted, still following up and sending homes, but that's, uh, that's another story. Have you, have you closed anyone from the pond? I have. Okay. So the way that I, I have seen the pond, the way we treat the pond on the team is that those are leads that no one else is reaching out to and they're kind of dead ish. Is that the way your team treats the pond? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we do reach out to them, but sometimes they just won't pick up the phone or, you know, it might take five, 10, 15 calls to get through to them, you know, catch them at the right time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's pretty much what it is. So here, here, people, is proof that dead leads are not dead. I have seen this so much with teams. They're like, I've called this person three or four times. They're not going to pick up. And, and, and this is in part because we, um, we don't want to make the calls. And so we look, when you don't want to do something, you look for the off-ramp to not do it. Oh, they're not responding to me. They, they've probably bought. This lead's old. They've got to have already done something. 
And I've seen this every time that we brought someone onto the team and we put them into the pond, they went and found deals. And this is what Liam is showing too. So do not ignore the old leads. There's gold in the follow-up. Almost every agent hopefully has heard that. Liam is proof of that. So good job, Liam. It, it's, it's really just doing it. And like I said, sometimes it's 15 attempts, which sounds insane, but I know for myself, I don't pick up phone calls I don't really recognize because so often it's the stupid um, car warranty stuff. So you have to do those attempts to actually get there if that's the route that you're going to build your business. So for you, is this the path, the main path that you're using to lead generate? Yeah, you know, um, I'm kind, I was kind of off and on with it a little bit because I got plenty of leads. And then I transitioned more into following up and then doing showings. And I fell into the loop of, oh, I got so much going on. I can't make calls, which uh, that's never true. You need to make those calls because what you do now pays off in three months. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, the uh, Fanatical Prospecting book goes pretty, pretty well into that. But, uh, you know, you got to make those calls. But the pond has been probably... Uh, the best way I've been getting leads, you know? That uh, is, I love, I love the story and I love to see it from an outsider, not me just trying to tell people to, it works. Here's the proof. I'm going to use this forever. All right. You get your first client. What did that feel like? You're going out, you're showing homes, you're writing a contract. So take me through that client. You get them, you're writing offers. What does that feel like? What's, are you nervous at all? Is there any, Try not to lead you, but that's the path where I'm going to go. Down. So uh, my first client was actually Spear. Uh, okay, good. Someone I, I helped sell their home actually in this market. You know, that, that was nice easy. Season. Yeah, but uh, I'll talk about my first pond lead that All I right. tra transacted with. So, um, you know, she was interested in this one specific neighborhood and I called her, you know, set her up on a, a drip campaign, sending homes. And then she was interested in one specific neighborhood and there was two homes listed. So we went and we saw those two homes and uh, she mentioned she actually had a home to sell. And uh, I was like, perfect. I'd love to swing by and take a look. But uh, ended up not hearing from her for a while. And then she uh, got back in touch with me. She's like, um, I just went under contract on a new build. And I put your name down. I was like, no kidding. Uh, that's uh, awesome. And then I ended up helping her sell her home too. Uh, so I hope to buy and sell. That transaction was not fun um, because we had quite a couple issues come up. But I got pretty lucky that, you know, she uh, put me down and that she chose me to sell her home. So a pond client who was an internet lead you left enough of an impression on her that she put your name down on new construction that she went out to by herself right mm -hmm. i really thought that story was going to go another way <laughs> her way my first year in real estate i listed someone's house gave them a deal apparently i didn't explain to them why i was giving them a deal on the list side and they they go hey mike guess what we just bought a house i was like what yeah there's new construction I was very lucky. I was able to get my name put on that contract, but I easily could have been snaked out of that. But yeah, that was, that was on me. So <laughs> I'm glad that worked out for you. So, yeah, because one thing that people talk about is those internet leads are not loyal. You got them, you got them and they were loyal enough to put your name down and not forget you, even though they disappeared for a couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, I showed them the home and then they didn't hear from them. So, uh, so I, one I, home, I showed them two homes in one neighborhood and uh, yeah, then I didn't hear for a while. And then. So one thing that I try to remind agents is that it's, it's on it's OTT. It's on their time. And we think we lose clients. Oh my God, they haven't gotten back to me. Um, you're just not the top priority at that moment. Now, luckily for you, they, they did re remember you. Were you following up while she was, Quiet. Were you still, hey, checking in? How are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? Yep. You know, uh, I was sending emails 
because she had quite a busy work schedule and that mm-hmm. might have been what played into her going ghost but i was still emailing and texting you didn't and, give uh, up did you have a moment where you're like oh this is a waste of my time i've lost her no uh you know i uh try to keep a um optimistic mindset i'm always trying to assume the best so uh you know i kept following up you should see some of the, my leads you know i've called them 20 30 times and i haven't spoke with them since the first time we spoke uh I'll call someone until they tell me to stop. I don't assume, uh, you know, it's not too much time out of my day to give them a call. So I'll but keep you've got it up. so many people to call. It's such a waste of time to call these people 20, 30 times is what everyone says. That, yeah, that's not true. Um, you know, if you have 30 follow-ups to make, you, a lot of them aren't going to get answered. It might end up taking 30, 40 minutes and then you can call new leads. If you block out an hour or two hours, you can get a lot done if you just put the distractions aside. Don't check your email. Just follow up and then call new leads. You can, you can make magic happen. This is gold. I love this. What, what has been the biggest surprise from where we talked last spring to now in real estate? What are you just like, wow, I did not expect this or this was fantastic, bad, whatever. What's your biggest surprise? There is a lot of issues when buying a home. There's a lot that can go wrong uh, from the inspection to the appraisal to the title. Um, The odds of everything going smoothly is not high. Uh, It happens. I've had it happen. But a majority of the time, you know, something comes back and you have to renegotiate. And uh, getting the contract is not the hardest part. (laughs) It's keeping it and closing it. So, uh that's the biggest shock because I think I mentioned it. We spoke before the podcast that, uh, you know, people tell you how hard it is to get business. They don't tell you how hard it is to close those deals once you go under contract. And so that just completely catches you off guard. Um, it's insane. How much do you credit your team to your success? Quite a bit. Um, you know, I put in the work, I do what I need to do, but there's a lot that you just don't know when you're new. So having, we have about 30, 35, 40 agents on the team and being able to reach out to them and ask questions because they've dealt with a lot of the issues. So asking those questions, you know, mind melding to come up with creative solutions helps a lot when closing deals. It helps a lot. I mean, you're, you're very driven, you're very capable, you're, you're resourceful, you figure things out. Was there a time where you were not going to go with the team and try to just try to figure it out on your own? Well, uh, a lot of people say don't join a team uh, for many reasons. People will say not to join a team. And I wasn't planning on joining one. I was going to be a solo agent, uh, you know. Then I found them, I felt the atmosphere and I looked at what they provided and I knew that's where I needed to go. And I can't imagine being a solo agent. There's so much when buying a home on the uh, agent end, I can't imagine doing it without a team, you know, some transaction people. Uh, It's not possible, you know, when you're brand new. It's so hard. The, the, The growth, the growth that happens on a team is amazing. And I know some people have done it without a team and they usually end up pulling in people from the office or whatever and, and create their own little mini team in a way of mentors and stuff. But I'm glad you're able to find that team because it sounds like they're, they're really good. Um, what was easier than you thought it was going to be? Uh, getting leads is actually uh, pretty easy. You know, um, I think internet leads are actually a pretty good way to go. You know, um, Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, Google. I think that's a pretty solid way to get some good leads because those people are actively searching. So um, if you can just keep following up, have good conversations and build value, you can get some pretty good clients. As long as you're willing to call them 20 or 30 times. Yeah, that's part of it. That's the caveat. 
there has to be insane follow-up to make internet leads work. And most people do not have that follow-up work ethic on these leads. And that's why it really fails for most people. Something like, like 10 times as many leads a couple of years ago were sold versus what actually bought. So that meant there are a lot of people being, you know, passed around, bought, you know, sold through different companies. So it's the people who do the follow-up and they can have an issue with loyalty. My big thing is if you, if you do internet leads, you have to be really fanatical with the follow-up and you have to go meet them as soon as possible because every real estate agent is exactly the same until you meet them and show them you're different. We're just interchangeable. It's that big thing about meeting them so they know you're real and what you provide. Um, so you're young, you look young. Has that been has that been an issue at all that you can? Most people aren't going to say it to your face. Some may, but ha, have you found that hinders you at all? I've actually had quite a quite a few people ask me how old I am, how long I've been in the business. Uh, it's, it's really some, it doesn't catch me off guard. And you know, tons of people, other agents. How old are you? And it was really bad when I was 18. Now I'm 19. So, you know, it, that's not <laughs> as bad. But uh, they would ask me, how old are you? I said, uh, well, uh, I'm 18. Like, when did you graduate high school? I was like, a couple months ago, uh, you know, this, this year, May. And uh, I'm sure they have their hesitations when they hear that. But my biggest thing is I try and build value and I leverage my team, you know, I may be young, I may be in my first year, but I have a huge team behind me of experienced agents. So you have nothing to worry about. That, I don't usually directly say it like that. And I haven't had too many issues. I've had people ask me how old I am, how long I've been in the business. I just answer, acknowledge and move along. Go to some other topic. Uh, the longer you stay on an issue, the bigger an issue it's gonna become. So if they ask you how long you've been in the business, oh, you know, uh, this is my first year and then move along, you know, just answer and don't, don't try and explain yourself. Uh, just keep moving. But uh, now I have some transactions under my belt. So I kind of leverage that as well. You know, someone asked, which actually people haven't been asking that much recently. I'm trying to grow it out a little bit, <laughs> you know, dress in a little bit professionally. So, uh, People don't. Well, I saw aren't. that suit when you when you came in the Zoom the other day. You were looked like you're wearing a suit and had a little pocket square. I think that helped. Oh yeah, I I, I love dressing up. Uh, even back in high school, you know, all the way back then, um, <laughs> I, I would wear button ups and polos. And uh, today I got on a sweater because it's okay. cold. Even down here in Florida, it's cold. We had ice. It looked like it snowed. I was like, what's going on? But uh. So I'm dressing a little bit more warm, but I love dressing up. I actually just bought two suits. Um, so I, I'm going to be picking them up today, actually. And I'm excited to wear those. But yeah, I think dressing up helps a lot. You know, yeah. obviously dress however you feel comfortable. If, you, if you're a cargo shorts and t-shirt guy, that's, that's what you do. Uh, but you want to be comfortable. I just happen to be comfortable dressing professionally. And I'm sure that helps make me look older and more professional so that that's good but yeah so what did your team leader see in you well first of all is there anyone else close to your age on the team we have someone they just turned 21 we have 25 um off the top of my head i can't think of any other agents that young we have some in their 30s but, you know, as far as being Those a Those are the teenager, old guys, right? They're 30? <laughs> yeah, we actually got quite the young demographic on my team. It's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, there's not many that are 18, 19, 20, you know, being teenagers. I think I might be the only one, so. When you were interviewing any of these brokerages, did anyone say, look, you're, you're too young? Anyone pull that crap? No, uh. I think I may have mentioned it in the last podcast. They want you, you know, they don't pay you a salary. You make them money. So yeah. as long as you're not unethical or just, you know, a bad person or really bad at your job and you're not willing to learn, they'll take you. 
Uh, it's not like trying to get an action of job. You interview them. So I didn't have anybody tell me that it wasn't going to work because the way I carry myself, I try to, you know, come across as a nice person. But yeah. Um, did your team leader, what, what did they say about your age and any obstacles in this career with that? Funny enough, uh, my team leader is a family friend and the team owner has uh, done deals with my parents. So uh, they, they knew my family on all ends. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't have to prove myself in a way because they know the way I was brought up. They know I'm not just some kid podium on the weekend and all that stuff. So um, I think they saw, you know, potential because they have seen my, you know, family. I'm, I'm sure that helped in a way. So how many deals have you closed so far? Four. Yeah, I've closed four First, deals. From, from a dead start, cold start in August to now, you've got four deals. And I know one of those was a crazy one that dragged on for a while. Yeah. And you kind of lost your focus because you got overwhelmed with the deals, right? So you weren't doing the prospecting, following up probably the way you were supposed to, right? Yep, exactly. That, that's it. So in six months, you got four deals on the board. Through online leads, through, de through partially dead leads too. Yep. And one sphere. One sphere, uh, two from the uh, dead pond leads, and one was from the pond, but they actually reached out, so... That, was, that that one was good. So what are your expectations for the next five years? What do you think is going to happen for you? Uh, you know, I'm going to become the best possible agent I can be. And then I'm going to help other people and, you know, grow with my team and then uh, leverage my team. So in the next five years, uh, I could I don't even know, you know. There's a lot that could happen in the next five years, but I'm excited for it. What was some of the training that was the most helpful for you? Either the stuff you did before you got your license or the stuff you've done since you got your license? Uh, the best training, we had a contract practice. So someone on my team would email me a property and then they would email a situation, uh, you know, FHA loan, they want to keep the swing set in the backyard. And then they'd have me do comps and write up the contract with whatever weird stuff they do in that email. And then I'd fill out all the other documents and then email it back. And I think that was a huge practice and huge help for getting comfortable writing contracts, getting used to the contracts, the wording. And that helped a lot with uh, actual deals. That's what I suggest to eight new agents is that they're doing three to five fake offers a week, even more, but I can't ever gain one to do more, but doing those just, so what, how long did it take you to write your first offer? Oh, uh, so I started, it must maybe a month and a half. For the no, first. no, I meant sitting down and writing up like either a practice offer. How, how, what was the. Did it take you an hour to write it all down? Oh, oh. Offer? yeah. You know, the first couple, um, they, they would start them easy and then progressively make them tougher. You mm -hmm. know, for the easy ones, it still probably took me an hour and a half around that. Mm -hmm. And then when they got difficult, I had to start calling people. I had no idea what to do. And that took longer, maybe two, two and a half hours. Um, <laughs> so it took a long time for these practice offers. And now how long would it take you to write up an offer? 10, 15 minutes. Yep. Uh, depends on the situation, but if it's a straightforward contract, especially if it's someone I've done multiple contracts for and they just want to keep the same terms and I know them, uh, yeah, 10, 15 minutes because now I'm comfortable. I know the contract uh, is pretty straightforward. Practice your offers, people. It's, it's not worth it to get – I mean – because think about that. There's no pressure that first time. It still took you all that time to write it. Imagine if there's someone like, I have to get this offer in by six to nine. You're like, because then you're stressed. You're like, I got to get this right. And you want to practice it before it gets 
to be a DEF CON situation. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, did you play sports at all in high school? Uh, I was kind of off and on. I never chose one sport and stuck to it. Um, I did a season of bowling. I did some chess, some weightlifting for, you know, a couple of years. Uh, a quick, very quick stint in football. Uh, turns out I'm not that good of a runner. And so I was going to do track, but after the football, that took that off my list. Um, I wanted to do swimming, but never got into it. And I wanted to do basketball, but never got into it. But my main sport was weightlifting and uh, bowling. Because some of the things that you talk about and the way that you present yourself made me feel like there was some kind of sport where you were being coached, where you were having to do something consistently. And, and they found that people who were heavy into sports actually have a better chance of succeeding in these kind of jobs because they're used to being told, you know, being coached and they're used to doing the boring, annoying details. Weightlifting is probably one of the worst. Because you have to be very, very consistent. You have to go through pain. And there are exercises that you absolutely hate to do. But you know, if you don't do this one exercise, everything else is, is not going to do as well. And so that, it's not exactly a sacrifice, but going through that instead of trying to avoid it. Like some people in, in some of the team sports can kind of, well, I'll just do this other thing I like. With weightlifting, you have to like hit every muscle. And you're like, stupid, this takes forever, whatever. So I think a lot of those sports situations help success in sales and really in real estate. What do you think? I agree. It's actually pretty funny. Um, so freshman year, I did weightlifting. I went to districts and I got last place. Uh, I had to gain a ton of weight so that I could lift up a class because we were short a lifter. So basically, it, we, we need to send two people per weight class. And uh, we only had one for the 183 class. And they needed someone. I was in the class under. So I ate a lot, drank a lot of water, weighed in. And then the other guys I lifted against actually laughed when I was doing my warm-up because the weight was so little. Uh, it didn't get under my skin. I knew, you know, I mean, these guys were behemoths. And I was not. And uh, so, but that's besides the point. My point is uh, I actually quit weightlifting quite a couple times throughout high school. Um, I was not consistent at all freshman year. I only went to districts because we needed someone. So uh, I, I was very, you know, flip, flippant. I, I would quit weightlifting a lot. I did one season of bowling and then I was done. Uh, I quit football almost immediately. And so, you know, I was quitting all these sports and I read the book from Angela Duckworth, uh, Grit. Grit. And she discusses the sports in high school. And I read that, that book recently. This wasn't back in high school, but I thought it was pretty funny because I quit pretty much every sport I did in high school. Uh, and here I am, you know, working hard, not quitting. Uh, I think I just didn't enjoy the sports, but I do think there is definitely a correlation doing the monotonous day after day boring things to get to where you want to be. Uh, I just didn't want to be in sports. Yeah, that makes sense. Any questions for me? Uh, what, what advice do you have for listing homes? Because listing is a whole different animal. Um, I think last time we spoke, I told you I wanted to be a listing agent. You know, it technically takes less time to list a home and less time, same money. Um, I've done a couple of listings and uh, I prefer the buy side, if I'm being honest. Really? Yeah. Why? Why do you prefer the buy side? I think there's so much more responsibility and expectations when you're listing a home. Um, yes. And if you're working with a buyer, if a deal is on the brink, that buyer can go find another home. If you're working with a seller and that deal might fall apart, they can't just sell another house. They got to sell that same one. So you need to be thinking, okay, this came back in the inspection. If we cancel this deal, when we go into contract again, 
that's going to come up again in the inspection uh, and, you know, stuff like that. And it's so much more, you need to be uh, more specific when doing the walkthrough and the listing appointment. And there's just a whole lot more to listing a home than there is helping someone buy. Uh, so do you have any advice for someone in listing? Do you, but do you want to list more? No, I don't. Uh, I want I want to help people buy, but all so these. What's the advice you want? Ah, uh, well, the the listings just keep falling in my lap. If I'm being honest, I I never once tried to list a home, but if I'm helping someone buy and they need to sell, I'd rather list a home than have another agent, and then that would just complicate it. Um, so all of my listings have just been by chance. If I'm being honest, um, so. My the advice I want if listings keep falling in my lap, mm -hmm. what do you suggest? Um, because I'll list them for the people, especially since some of them sphere, but just the listing process is there any nugget you have that you found after years of doing it? I think expectations are the big thing. I think with either side, where a lot of the conflicts come up is where we kind of, oh, I hope this slides by. Oh, I saw that little bit of dry rot outside. Eh, we'll figure that out when it comes. You're just postponing problems. So saying expectations of what's going to happen when, um, communication. The difference, you, you've kind of explained the difference between, between buyers and sellers really well. Buyers, hey, it's, it's a party. Let's go look at homes. All right, let's write up this offer. Oh, it really sucks. We, you know, this fell apart. Let's go find another home. What sellers is like, I have to be out of this house. How will you sell this house? Why isn't this house sold yet? Why aren't I getting my price? You're right. They are completely two different animals on the way that the clients are reacting to you. Um, on the sell side, that pushy agent who will continue to call and all that actually usually reverberates better with them because they wanna know someone is going to stick with them and fight for them. And you'll get these people like, I want a million dollars for my house. I only think it's worth 350. <laughs> you don't believe in my house? <laughs> I don't believe in that price. I believe in, and it becomes this weird thing. So um, listings, listings have just a different kind of urgency to them. And you can have other people there like, oh my God, I'm, my lease is over. I gotta find a house, I gotta find a house. But you're right, there, there's likely another house that's going to come on the market. Sellers never know when the next buyer is coming on the market. And you'll get some, they're like, I need more advertising. I want to be in the Wall Street Journal. I want to be in USA Today. I want to be in Travel and Leisure. It's a condo. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really those demands. And if you set the expectations ahead, this is the kind, there's a book called Never Split the Difference. Have you heard of that? I have. Um, have you read it? Uh, I want to, but I was recommended to listen to it in an audio book because mm -hmm. that is completely di different than just reading it. So okay, uh, I'm not a huge audio book fan. So that's what's been holding me up. Um, he talks in a, in a, and it's, he explains something I'd never, I knew, but I hadn't thought of it in this term. When he's talking to these, um, these kidnappers, well, he's talking to the people who've been, the family's been kidnapped. And what they, he does is he talks about, I illuminate the path. He, he's there's a famous one. He talks about where this kid gets kidnapped in Haiti. And he goes, look, Haitian kidnappers don't kill their, the kidnappees. But what they do like to do is they want to party. So if you do what I say, when I say it, I'm going to get your kid back on, on Friday night or Saturday morning. He knew... So he walked up and he, no, he didn't walk up. It was a phone call. His thing was that the person was expecting the FBI to come knock on his door and he gets a call. He's like, how are you going to help from there? And he showed his knowledge. So if you can explain to me, this is how the sales process is going to happen. We're going to put your house on the market on a Friday. The reason we're doing it on a Friday afternoon is we, we want everyone to go see it through the weekend. We're going to hold, hold an open house on Sunday. We're going to have offers due by Monday at two o'clock. Um, Probably in this house, we're expecting this kind of buyer, maybe this is big of a family. We're expecting to have, you know, the more that you can say, 
illuminate the path. This is how it's going to be. And this is how we're expecting it. That can release their fears because our biggest fear is the unknown. And their unknown is when are we going to get a buyer? With the buyers, well, they know other homes are going to come up. So they, they don't have that same fear. So expectations, showing them what to, to see and what you think is going to happen based on your experience. And what we've told people on the team is use all of our numbers, use all of our experience. That's yours. You've seen it. You've heard it. It's your experience. So it's taking away the unknowns. And that's kind of what those expectations does. Does that kind of, that kind of help? Yeah, that's really good. Uh, setting the expectation. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. That's one thing I, I feel comes with experience and mm -hmm. I want to get better at because I'm sure it helps a lot. So the, the thing that you mentioned earlier, when someone asks your age, you don't stay on it too long, which is perfect. But what a lot of new agents do is they're afraid of getting into the weeds. I'm not saying you, so I'm, I'm talking more generally, but a lot of agents are afraid of bringing up things you don't know a lot about yet. Maybe they don't know the market as well as someone else or whatever. And so skipping buyer consultations or going too quick through listing presentations, they end up missing all these things because they're afraid of getting a question they can't answer. So it's getting the knowledge up to the point that you can do that easily. And it sounds like you've done a lot of those things, but sitting down and answering the questions, any of the things that you've learned from your past clients of like what their expectations are that these things aren't going to happen. Sometimes people are going to think the market's hotter than it is. Um, just, you want to just really control all those as much as you can, which will in turn show you as the expert and make them relax a little bit. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good about what you mentioned about some people think the market's hotter than it is. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's going into a downturn, but it's definitely not growing at the speed at which it once was, in my opinion, at least uh, where I'm at. And there's actually a lot of people who aren't looking at homes because they think it's an extremely hot market. So a lot of buyers are just out of the game because the way that they think it's going and uh, that right. hurts sellers too. Something, something else I'll um, give you advice on is about pricing the home. So often agents go, well, I think the price should be 350. And then you list at 350 and no one's buying. But Mike, you said it was 350. Well, you know, some things have changed and, you know, there's blah, blah. It all focuses on you. So two things that I do, well, one other thing that I do a little bit different is I, when I go on a listing appointment, I take all the, I take the full comparables. I don't just do the pretty CMA that has nice graphs and charts. I take the full comparables and go, well, here's a house similar to yours, but it's different here and here. This one's different here and here. I, le I lead them to the price because if they come up with the price, if they can see the price clearly, they're not going to fight you and try to raise it. Also, never say, I think the price is. What I'm reading the market is at mm -hmm. is this. Because the market, this market is super tight and it, it fluctuates so much. What's the value today is not going to be the same value next month. So it's always the market says, not I say. Does that make sense? Yep. And then you can say, well, looks like the market's changed. But if you take those comparables and they can come up with that price themselves, then, then you've, you've won the battle because quite often they always want to price it higher. And we took a listing a um, year and a half ago, two years ago, where someone priced it at the top. It actually, in this great market, it expired. And we were getting multiple offers on everything. So we took it and we said, look, you need to price it. $25,000 less. And like, no, we want the most for the property. We have to, we will negotiate down, but we're not going, trust us. We've seen this over and over. If you price it low, you're going to get in a multiple offer situation. And there's a thing with social proof. Oh, someone else has wrote an offer. Okay. Well then it is worth it. I've seen this so much where someone's like, Oh, I don't know if I want to buy it. I don't know. I don't know. And then it gets a pending. Ah, oh, I should have wrote an offer on it. Social proof matters. We got that person more than it was previous listed for in, wow. in winter. 
because we got social proof and got all this. So it's that pricing low in a hot market is going to get you more money, typically. So a lot of those people who always try to get, leave in wiggle room, it, it doesn't actually work. You need to price it right and you're going to sell faster. The longer it sits in, at least for my part in, in uh, my market in Portland, if you go past two weeks, you're stale and people start questioning why, why it's still on the market. Mm -hmm. You want to price it right, get it gone the first week or two and move on. So there's some more advice. Yep. That's really good. You know, we look at it, uh, two weeks, you know, we say 10 days, the, uh, there's a curve and after 10 days, the amount of attention drops off. So you want to make sure you don't let it drop off because yeah, people are going to start asking, well, what's wrong? Why, uh, why isn't it pending yet? So uh, you want to put it in at market value and let it climb. So that's uh, really good what you said. I, I completely agree. And we're dealing with that down here as well. Well, anything else? Uh, not off the top of my head. I think, uh, I think I'm all good. Well, I'm excited to watch you in your career. Um, I love that you're getting such a head start on real estate and that you're with a great team that's really working out for you. I see some, I see some big things and I think you're going to, you're just going to do great. And we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. Maybe we'll do a follow-up here in a six months or a year and see where you <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. And if you ever need anything, just reach out to me. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Have a good one.